Hey, you know what? We showed you the solo track fencing machine, and today we thought you'd see the place where these solo track fencing machines are made and talk to the man himself. This is Simon Dale in York, England, and he's the guy that built, developed, and is always trying to improve that machine. So now he's not from England. No, I'm he's I'm a Kiwi. Originally from New Zealand, but fenced in, in England for 15 years and developed the idea there and then went on to build them with what I thought was you know, the best system I could come up with. Now, if you think you know what the solar track fencing machine is, you probably don't know everything and you might have some misconceptions. We'd like to dispel those right now. Who better to tell us that than Simon? So the Maruka we build on is the, is the MST300. Recently, I think 2019, the emission rules have taken it out of the US market. So we're working on building on a new MST300, which is a US built machine, fully emissions compatible, more powerful, essentially a better version of the existing, which is an excellent machine. And these will be brand new track bases, right? Yep, brand new so, track. So no wore out parts, no hours, no nothing, zero hours, ready to go to work in your fencing business. Yeah. For years to come, hopefully. So, hey, let's go see how these things are built. Yeah, so we do some refurbing here as well. So we've got a machine in for a customer that wants it refurbing, tidying up. But most of what we're doing now is second-hand bases being stripped down, refurbed, and then fitted out. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see how they're built. This looks like a frame jig. So this is a frame jig for making up the netters. Pretty uh, simple rotary jig. So you can operate, it's two-sided, so you can put components on both sides. It just makes life easier for the guys welding. It makes it a less technical weld as well. There's nothing, you know, no verticals. It's just really trying to keep life simple. Yeah. Make it easier. We like simple. Yeah. Well, I'm relatively simple, so, you know, you've got to be. Yeah, so everything comes in this door. Parts are all laid out on the shelves, so everything's picked off here onto the welding bays, guys stitching it together. I think people's main concern would be the engine, engine hours, things like that in a used machine. Yeah, but engines as a rule are the, are the cheapest component on a track machine. It's your pumps, your final drives, your bottom, all your rollers, your running gear, that's where the money is. So um, as long as they're sound, you, you know, and we have very few problems with the Marukas, they're just a bomb-proof unit. Very, very well made. I mean, you can see the running gear on these compared with anything else on the market, the size of the bottom rollers, they are. Yeah, these bogey wheels is what we call them, I guess, but yeah. the, those idler wheels down there are getting solid. So I'm gonna guess, is this a mast? That's, yeah, that's the mast I-beam, and then most of the stuff is for solo nets. So do you send all these parts out to be cut? Yep, it all comes in laser cut. Perfect cut every time. And then you get better quality out of it. Yeah. So as we mentioned when we saw the solo track, one of the key features is this is a this is an I beam rather than being a welded beam. So there's no welds to break on that, which is as we know kind of a big deal. Well, there's no stress in the steel. The problem with welding is you create stress, and unless you heat treat it at vast expense, you're going to have that stress in the weld all the time. So the bit that's doing the work, there's no stress in it. Yeah. And this is our spray shop, so everything's shop blasted outside and then all sprayed in here. So you sandblast everything before you coat yep. it so that you get good adhesion? It just doesn't last if you don't. It's worth the extra time. I can tell you, I've seen Brand X and how they paint, and it's basically just in a shed outside. And yep. There's no shop blasting. It's all about trying to develop your product and make it better. Then you get to have all your colors. And then we put finished parts on the shelves in here, ready for assembly. See now, look at that. That is, that is nice looking paint. Did you see that paint? That's nice paint. That's not just painting over bare steel. That's, that's pride and workmanship. So this looks a lot different than the weight that we saw before. Yeah. So are you redesigning your weight? It came about because we couldn't get the billets. So we've redesigned them um, this way. So what's your most popular weight? 340 kilos. 340 kilos. Now you can go bigger or? We that? can, but it's funny talking to people that have been running 400s. Like Peter was running a 400 before, and he said he's no discernible distance because we're dumping faster. It's all about getting rid of that hydraulic fluid so that ram yep. comes down very quickly. It's getting into free fall. Is this a refurbished track base here then? Yep. That's a that's a 300. That's going to Australia, but it's having full remote kit put on it. And how long have you been doing the remote kits? Peter's was the first one. So two years, you finding more and more people are liking the remote? Probably not that common. 
the sort of thing it appeals to owner operators more than it does to guys that are buying machines for other for men to work on. Yeah. A lot of guys won't get the use out of it, whereas the owner operators like to make it work for them. Yep. And the new Maruka 300s will be remote ready. It's so all remote it's ready. Cake. Yeah. So it means that some, someone can buy a machine and add it later as well. well cool. Yeah, and you guys can tell it. You guys go way through them. Like all these hoses are obviously new. We replace everything that we think needs replacing. But don't forget, if you're in America, you're going to get a new base. Yeah. yeah. Because of the engine situations. So. Yeah, or you get a pre-2013. Yeah, or pre-2013 if you really want to roll the dice. Yeah. But because we can get them made in the States, there's not going to be the shipping costs. That's kind of, that's kind of big news, isn't it? That'll be a big deal. Oh, it'll be a game changer for us, yeah. Yeah, that'll be a big deal. A lot of people don't get that in the fencing application, a post driver, the vibration levels are massive. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, that's what cracks all the welds and everything. Yeah. That's why post caps don't last. That's why the I-beams are splitting on welded I-beams. It's also the way they're made. So we, we don't replace caps. Yeah, I was asking Peter about the caps. And it's just a simple tweak to the way they're made. And it's the same with the I-beam, having that solid I-beam sliding within a shaft. So all the vibrations pretty much contained in that outside section. It doesn't transmit a lot through, so you don't get that real shock load going into the breast of the machine. Well, cool. So this probably isn't very far from being done, huh? Just a remote to go on it, and then, then we're good to go. Yeah, I didn't even really think that you're, I mean, you're designing, you designed and built all the blade and its functionality and all that stuff. That's pretty cool. Little tub. Peter had all those used up. Then he's added a bunch more stuff. It's like, oh, I need this. Oh, he's got, it's like a Christmas tree, isn't it? But we use, that, we use those oil tubs because everyone's got one. So when you break it, you don't have to buy a new tub. You just grab one out of your, your workshop and chuck it in. Still try to keep things really simple if I can. I, don't, I think you can make things overly complex, and particularly with post drivers. Yeah. You can have a lot of movements that actually are just not necessary. I like this. This feels good. They're the best bloody things you can have. That's real nice. Does that one get in the winch? Yep. And we only use hydraulic winches. Again, it's probably your last port of call, but when you need it, the cost of getting recovered will pay for the winch in one, in one recovery. So for the guys that are doing it, you know, in that sort of country. Yeah. Um, so this is the whole of the factory, huh? Yeah, this is it. That's cool. And then that's our solo net stuff we do. So that's excavator mounted. This one's heavy duty for sure. So that's the bigger clamp, but then we do do a, a 2.8 meter for the US market. So we've shipped a few of them over there. For the eight foot tall deer fence? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is solo track. Now, one of the things that I'm impressed by is the fact that some of these places you see and you think, oh, they must have some great big massive building, but people are building some amazing stuff with relatively little shops. And it's not like you have to have some great big huge production facility to accomplish a lot. Like you're building some amazing machines with very little space uh, using what you have available, right? Yeah, and it's not, you don't need a lot of tech. You just need good men. Yeah, good people. So you don't have to have some great big, huge, fancy building to get a lot of really cool stuff done. I think that's important because we always want the skies and the moon and everything else, but you know, start where you're at and do, if you want to do stuff like this, then start wherever it is that you're at. Cause it's better to do something than do nothing because you think that you have to have something that is not necessary to the process. Yeah. Not to mention a big, huge, fancy building would only cost the fencers more, right? Yeah. Operating efficiently saves, saves us all money. Yeah. And we, you know, we it's not about high volume. Well, Simon, I really appreciate you showing us this stuff. I hope you guys have enjoyed the tour of Solo Track and learning a little bit more about the Solo Track machine as well as the Solo Net. And until next time, from England, you have a good dang day.